If you don't know me, I am Pastor Brad. Joy to have you with us. Thanks for taking time out. We have busy schedules. We have lots of demands on our lives, and yet you're here now, and uh, we're, we're grateful for that. And believe it or not, that's actually what we're going to talk about today. We're going to get to this fact that we have demands on our lives, and we have to decide what to do with them. Uh, what we just read was the entire first chapter of the book of Haggai. Now, how many of you have spent a lot of time in your own personal getting to know Jesus time reading your Bibles in the book of Haggai? Lots of people. Uh, you don't even know where to find it, son. I can call you out. You're my boy. All right, Gwen, I believe that. Yeah, most of us uh, uh, have not. This is one of the books. This book of Haggai is one of what's called the minor prophets in our Bibles. Okay, so you've got your Old Testament, your New. The New Testament uh, is centered around the person, life, and work of Jesus. The Old Testament was the Hebrew Bible, the, the Holy Scriptures for God's chosen people, the, uh, Israel. And in there, you've got law, you've got poetry, you've got narrative and history, and then you have these sections of prophecy. And you have these, this group called the major prophets, and then another group called the minor prophets. And this is not like baseball, okay? It's not like major league and minor league. Like, you know, the minor, the minor prophets couldn't quite hack it, so they couldn't get all the way up to the major. This is really talking about length more than anything else. So the major prophets are chapters upon chapters upon chapters. The minor prophets are just a handful most of the time. Like Haggai is only two chapters long. And we just read the fir first chapter. So we're halfway through the book already. You didn't know I could move that fast, did you? Well, don't worry, we're gonna slow down. We're gonna, we're gonna hop back and look at it. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna have the opportunity to look at this powerful message that Haggai has. And uh, if you look at the dates that, that the prophet Haggai actually shares as you go through, he really only has any kind of official ministry for four or five weeks that's recorded in history. This is not some guy who was long, uh, with, with long notoriety with, with the Jewish people, that he had all these things that he did. He was called out for a very specific point in time, for a very specific reason, to share this message with God's people. So let's hop in. If you've got your Bibles, I encourage you, go to the book of Haggai. It's close to the New Testament, because it's, it's actually the third to last book in your Old Testament. But if you go there, uh, don't try to flip through and, and find it quickly, because if you're using a paper Bible, it's only one page long and you'll miss it, okay? So you can use the table of contents if you need to. If you've got your Bible apps, you can just go there. But we're going to walk through Haggai, because this week it's a lot of information to kind of set us up for what's going to come in the weeks to follow. So let's start here in Haggai 1.1. And who wants to give, uh, uh, give Lindsay a round of applause for tackling those names? And I need you to know, um, uh, her boyfriend, Jason, uh, was actually raised Jewish. So I had asked him to read this because I figured we could let the guy who has Jewish roots try to deal with all these Jewish names, right? Well, he got sick, so Lindsay had to pinch hit today. She got the paper like 30 minutes ago, so she did a great job, and uh, I just want to say thank you for stepping in there, and I will probably butcher these names, and that's okay. You don't lose Jesus points for that, okay? So we're, we're all right here. Uh, okay, there we go. <laughs> it's it, it, the, almost the participation trophy when it comes to pronouncing the names. But let's, let's read this again. In the second year of Darius the king. And Darius was the guy in charge who was overseeing the Jews outside of, uh, outside of their land. They are in the middle of something called the Babylonian captivity. So Darius is not a Jewish king. This is a Babylonian or Persian king who has uh, the Jewish people under him that have been taken out of their promised land because of their disobedience. So in the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to, to Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Jehozadak the high priest. That just, man, that just cuts you deep, doesn't it? Real emotional stuff there. 
Well, let's dig into it because although this isn't like, you know, and no one's going to go, oh yeah, Haggai 1.1 is my, my favorite verse, you know. That's not going to happen, I get it, but there's a lot of information that kind of sets us up for where we're going. So let's just kind of like dig into this just a little bit. So the first guy on the scene that we see is Darius. And like I said, he was a uh, Persian king. Uh, this was, uh, in the historical record, Darius I, Histaspes. I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but that's who the historical record says it was. He seized the throne of Persia after Cambyses' death, and this all happened around 520, 522 B.C. So on the scene now is this Darius king. He is king in Babylon, but he is not the one who had conquered the Jewish people. And if you look at the uh, contemporary books of what's going on, you go to the book of Ezra. And in the book of Ezra, we see that um, the, the guy before him had said, Jews, you may go back to Jerusalem. Go back. And in fact, uh, Cyrus said, you, God revealed to me that you're supposed to rebuild your temple. So get out of here. This happened about 14 to 16 years before Darius is on board. Now that Darius is in here, there's already been a command given to go back. He wasn't the guy who originally taken him. And so now they have the opportunity to really go and begin this work that God had given them to do. So while Darius is ruling from Babylon, these uh, things start happening. And, and Haggai, this is the uh, really the only teaching example we have, the book of Haggai, of anything this prophet said, okay? He is mentioned in two other places, in Ezra 5.1 and in Ezra 6.14, where it just calls him out as a prophet, that he was prophesying during this time, because the book of Ezra chronicles some of the rebuilding of the temple. So that's, that's the only mentioning he has. Nothing is known about his age or his ancestry, but he preached in Jerusalem, for uh, some estimates, like I said, four or five weeks, the, the big ones are up to four months or so around this year, 520 BC. So Darius is just on the scene. Haggai shows up, and this is the only stuff that we have from this prophet. He's only concerned with the topics that we're getting into. But who are these other guys? Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel the governor of Judah. Well, Zerubbabel's name, uh, it actually looks like the, uh, he, he was a, a Jew, but he had been given a Babylonian name. And it looks like it comes from um, uh, the Babylonian expression for something of seed or shoot of Babylon, meaning he was to represent Babylon as a Jewish person in this place. He had been given authority. He was called, he's called the, the son of Shealtiel five times in this book. And if you go back, if you look in uh, Chronicles and other places, you can see the family tree spread out. He is the grandson, and this, this will matter. We will get back to this on our last week, okay? When we wrap up Haggai, this matters. He is the grandson of Jehoiachin. That's probably one of your favorite uh, Bible characters too, right? You know, you, we, we, we sing songs about Jehoiachin. Well, Jehoiachin was of the line of King David, and we're going to see why that matters. And he is called the governor of Judah, which comes from a Persian Akkadian word that designates a high government official. So this guy has authority. This is, in essence, the legal uh, governmental uh, ruler for the, for the Jewish people in Jerusalem as a represent, representative of King Darius, so the, representing uh, Babylon, but having rule and authority in a secular sense with the Jewish people. And then we get to Joshua. And this was Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, and all we're told is that he's the high priest. But why this was included is Haggai is speaking to Zerubbabel, He's the governmental leader. He's the, uh, that, that legal entity, as well as the spiritual leader, Joshua. So Zerubbabel and Joshua represent, for the Jewish people, the whole of their society. The, this is a way of saying that there's nobody left out, whether in a religious sense, a, a, a governmental sense, any of that. All the Jews are in view here that Haggai is delivering this message. But something we want to remember, too. Because they have been given the mission, like I said, when we looked at Ezra, to rebuild the temple. Why did the temple need to be rebuilt? Well, what had happened was the nation of Israel had shown disobedience for a vast number of years in a variety of ways. 
And what was threatened to happen eventually came true and this thing called the Babylonian captivity took place. Now, uh, years before in the Northern Kingdom, there had been the Assyrian captivity because the Jewish people had split. The Assyrian captivity took, the, took a group out a long time ago and there's no reference of them ever returning from that. But what we have with this Babylonian captivity is that the nation of Babylon came in, swept in, captured the Jewish people and deported them out. And they were captives in the land of Babylon for 70 years, exactly what was prophesied in scripture. And what we find here with the book of Ezra and where Haggai is speaking into it, they have been released at the end of 70 years of captivity to go back and rebuild the very temple that was destroyed when they were captured. So this is setting back. They are now able to get step back into the covenant promises that God had given to them. This was their heritage. This was their legacy. This is what they had been promised. This, their hopes and their dreams were wrapped into it. And this temple meant something. Now, when we think of temples, we, we don't gather at a temple, right? We have a church building, but it's not a temple. We think temple, we think, you know, animals that are like, stabbed and killed and such and you know the, the, we just have these pictures in our minds of what a temple is but even at this point when it was way more ritualized when there was way more if we can say liturgy to it where there were animal sacrifices and things like that all of that taken into account the purpose of the temple was about the presence of god it was clearly marked out. We see it in the Garden of Eden, and there's even temple language in the Garden of Eden, through to what was called the tabernacle, if you're familiar with the story of Israel, when they were at one point taken into slavery for hundreds of years, and then as they left and they were going to the promised land, they had a tabernacle, which was an elaborate tent that was set up to house the presence of God in, their, in the midst of the community. And then when they were given their home land, the promised land, they built this temple, and this temple was to represent where God's presence was. Now, what we know from Scripture is that God is called omnipresent. Have you guys heard that term before? Yeah. It means God is everywhere at all times, at all points. There is no place in all of the created order where God's presence is not. But there is also a sense that there is a separation between the holy of holies, God in his, uh, in his core essence, and everything else. And so what happens is whether the tabernacle or the temple, this was a place where that essence of God intersected with the, uh, the created order, particularly where humanity, those made in God's image, could commune with the, with the uncreated, holy God of gods. That's what the temple was. It was all about the presence. And it was about demonstrating that presence and living out that presence from that place. It was the locus. It wasn't supposed to be all kept there. It was the focus, the center, but it was supposed to expand out. And that's what you need to remember, why they were supposed to go back. This was the calling, not just to you know, stack some bricks. It was all about stepping into the presence of God. The temple was the place on earth that manifested the presence of God. It was the visible symbol of who God was, his might, his power, his glory, his beauty, his love for his creation. All of it was here, and it was supposed to be spilling out then to the world from this place. And yet, there was a problem. Even though, starting with Cyrus, the king before Darius, was, they were sent back to rebuild this temple, explicitly told that that pagan king said, your God told me you're supposed to do it, go do it. Something happened. And that's where we get to verse 2. Look at Haggai 1, starting in verse 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts. This is Haggai's message from the Lord to the people. These people, the Jews, say the time. They say it. This is not God. The people say this. The time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Let me say with absolute assurance, that was bull hunky. Okay? It was was time. The whole context was they were not only allowed, they were commanded to do this. God was saying, too long has my presence not been felt and experienced. You must get back to this. I will move heaven and earth to make this possible. I need you to step into it. And yet, if you read Ezra and some of these other accounts, what begins to happen is you see that there was resistance. It wasn't easy. And people weren't getting it their way. 
And they said, it's too hard. And that became a real problem. This is where Haggai's coming on. God's saying, you're saying it's not time, but I told you to do it. Look at verse 3. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house, the temple, what I called you back here to do, lies in ruin? So, the Jewish people were released from their captivity, told, go and manifest my presence to the world. Show the world that my presence matters, that I love you all so much. I want goodness and, and mercy and justice just overflowing from this place so people can gather around it and launch into the world, living the kind of lives I want them to live because I love you all so much. Do this. I have set you free to do this. And they go and said, you know, I got to take care of my stuff first. This idea of paneled houses, we might not think too much of that. You might be thinking back to like 1970s wood paneling in your basement, right? And you know, well, that's not all that fancy, right? Well, in this time, in this place, to have an interior paneled building what was a sign of great comfort, okay? That was extravagance for your, for your common living. And yet the people were focused on their own extravagance, what they liked, their preferences and how life was going to go about rather than focusing on the very thing that God had called them to do, the very thing that they had been set free from literal slavery to do, released from slavery to serve the Lord and to make his presence known. And they're like, yeah, but I got to take care of me first. This is an issue of priorities. It absolutely is. And I don't think it's an issue of priorities that is limited only to the Jewish people of this time. The point of us looking at this is not to say, oh man, those, those were bad Jews. Shouldn't do that. Guys, I think this is a beautiful, amazing picture that we can hold on to of what we have to wrestle with today, each and every one of us, and as a church family. So I'll say it this way. A Jesus following life, why we exist. Our purpose is to help people live Jesus-centered lives. That's why our community of God's people exists. A Jesus-following life prioritizes his presence and his values over self-interest. Now be careful with this, because I know we all tend to be people of extremes. So I, I can guarantee you, whether in this room or online right now, someone's thinking, so what I want and anything about me doesn't matter? That's not what we're saying. God made you beautifully, uniquely you. He gave you desires and passions and inclinations, and all of that can be used for your good and for his glory, absolutely. But let me tell you, because I have a, a kind of a unique vantage point in many ways to see how things play out. And uh, I would suggest that we do need to have a reprioritization. It's why we're calling this series we're in priorities. Because it's not that, well, I'm giving everything away and who I am at my core has just been absolutely washed away. That's not the problem we have. Generally speaking, here in our culture, our North America, maybe if we just want to say United States of America culture, me gets the priority, right? For each one of us. What I want, what I need, what I like, what I got to take care of. And uh, Francis Chan, if you guys know that name, he did a series on this years ago, and he likened it to this. He said, when someone comes to Christ, what we try to do uh, in America is it's like we're driving a car. And Jesus offers us forgiveness and salvation, and we're like, oh, that's awesome. So we hop out of the car, right? We pop the trunk and tell him to crawl in. We want him to come along for the ride, but I don't want him to distract me from where I'm going or what I'm doing. I don't want him to have input on to, to, to what location I'm going to end up at or how fast I'm driving or how I yell. He can stay in the trunk until I need him. Oh, wait, I'm scared. Oh, no, I have this problem. I can pop the trunk and go, hey, Jesus, I, 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 could, I could use a little help right now. Okay, thanks, and then close it. Francis Chan says that is how we approach that, and that's what this picture is. We're worried about paneling our homes 
rather than, de than screaming out, crying out, lauding out the glory of God because we recognize how good he's been to us, the love he's shown us. So a Jesus-following life will prioritize his presence, his values, living his way above me necessarily getting what I want all the time. And it is a shift for us. It is taking us from being self-centered to being others-centered because that's what's important to God. Keep reading in, in Haggai, verse 5 now. It says, Now therefore, therefore, says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Powerful words. Something that we should latch on to more and more. This is the idea of reflect. The, the original language kind of has the idea of uh, map out your heart. See the direction your heart is going. That's what this phrase means. We have to look at what we're doing and say, yes, this does line up with, with, with God, with, his, with manifesting his presence, or it doesn't. We don't get to go, well, you know, it doesn't really matter. I'm not, I'm not going to think about that. We're being called to think deeply about and to do a form of evaluation. And then he says, why do you have to do it? And here's the condition, starting at verse 6. You have sown much, planted stuff, and yet you've harvested little. You eat, you put food in your mouth, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. He who earns wages, you're doing the work, right? He does so to put them into a bag with holes. This picture, again, I, in so many ways, I think this is a picture of 2023 North America. We're constantly trying to jam more in, but we're not getting satisfied because we have the wrong priorities. We're focused on the wrong things. And at the core of it is this, this kernel of selfishness that I think all of us have to wrestle with, that it, that it kind of hides behind all of our other stuff and why we're doing stuff. It informs our motivations. We need to be careful because I will try to give myself satisfaction with things that cannot inherently satisfy or not ultimately satisfy. So I really think, and, and that's why these words, consider your ways are so important. We know this is true in many, many avenues of our life, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll say this about it. A Jesus following life evaluates what it means to invest in his priorities. We have to consider our ways. When we go shopping, consider our ways. Are we evaluating how we're using the resources God has given us to honor him and those he loves? Are we considering our ways? Are we evaluating our priorities uh, alongside of his? When you uh, go to work and you do your job, are you just doing it to get, get through and be done? Or are you doing it, like the Bible says, as unto the Lord? Can, will you consider your ways and evaluate it, how to invest in his priorities? When you gather together uh, in the uh, coming weeks, we've got Thanksgiving coming up. We've got Christmas, two of my most favorite times of the year. I love them to death. When you're engaging with family and someone says something that you find incredibly offensive, or politics, yes, Okay, that can be part of it. If, when someone says something incredibly offensive or you just find annoying or even painful, how will you respond? Consider your ways. Are you investing all of what God has given you, the image he has placed into you? Are you evaluating it to make sure that you're investing in his priorities and not your own? Because as, if we're just trying to take care of me, I'm just trying to eat so I'll be full. I'm trying to drink so that I'm not thirsty. I'm trying to clothe myself so I'm warm. I'm going to work really, really, really hard. If I'm doing all that to protect me, to take care of me, I'm going to miss out on the glory of what it means to be a child of God who loves others. I've said it so many times, church. If we all take that biblical approach where we become about others, we become other-centered, no one is left out. The world will tell you, take care of yourself first. If, maybe if you've got something left over, you can help others. Maybe if you've got something left over, you can add some Jesus-iness to it, right? But you've got to take care of you first. That is the opposite of the priorities that we're seeing and what Haggai is pushing us to. He's like, you're worrying about all those things. And Jesus actually talks about that. 
He says, you worry about all these things. You have anxiety about all these things. Uh, but if you seek first his righteousness, all that stuff will be, that stuff will get taken care of, the Bible tells us, when we do it the Jesus way. And the Jesus way is about caring for others, even if it costs us. That's the thing we don't like. We like the idea, we like to agree with, oh yeah, that would be really nice if, you know, that person got help. That would be nice. Now, I'm not going to do anything about it, but it would be really nice. Again, Francis Chan has talked about it and said, it's, you, you don't get um, uh, participation trophies for, uh, for righteousness. You don't get, well, I showed up and, and said I agreed, so I, I, I get points for it, right? A, a Jesus following life will evaluate and see if we're lining up. But it doesn't just evaluate, it goes beyond that. Look in verse 7. It says, thus says the Lord of hosts, again, do you see these words? Consider your ways. And you've heard me say this before. If the Bible says something once, do we have to believe it? I would say yes. If the Bible says we have to do something one time, do we have to do it? Yes. So if the Bible says the same thing more than once, guess what that means? You're supposed to do it, and God is giving you a key, a, a little insight, that whatever this is is important. So he just said, consider your ways. And now what? Uh, one verse later, two verses later, he goes, oh, by the way, don't forget, you need to consider your ways. Because we're going to be tempted not to. We're going to be tempted to just brush it off or just do it without thinking. He says, consider your ways. And what does that mean? It's not just an intellectual thing. Verse 8, go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house. <clears throat> See, the idea was they would have to go up to where the trees were. Uh, the uh, area around Jerusalem is not necessarily uh, filled with lush redwood forests. So finding the wood they need took intentionality. It took work. They had to locate it. They had to bring it down. They had to mill it. And they had to use it for the, for the end. It wasn't just do some busy work. It was do the hard work here. And while doing it, accomplish this task. We have been given a task, church, just like the Jewish people of the day. Now, how we go about it's a little different. They were building a physical structure to center it. We are told to take the presence, if we've trusted in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, we've been promised the Holy Spirit abides within us. We are to take that presence into our community. We're to manifest his presence into the community. We are to build that house, that place where his presence is made known in our communities, with our friends, with our families, at work, at school, in every sphere that God has blessed us with the opportunity to be a part of. We get to build the house. We get to manifest God's presence. Now, why? And this is a very interesting one. And again, I think this butts into American uh, Christianity a little bit. Why would we do the work of church? Well, it might be because, well, we, we want more people uh, in the seats. We'd like, you know, our budget to be a little bit bigger so we can do this. You know, I like, uh, I want to build the church so that we have more musicians so we can do this, that. There's a lot of me-centeredness that can come along just naturally because of how we're wired to, to building the church. But what is the point of building the church? Look here, he says, or building the house, manifesting that presence, that I may take pleasure and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. So who is to get pleasure out of building the house? Who? The Lord. God. Who is supposed to get glorified? The Lord. What we do is not for me. It's for him. Now, why would we do that? Why would we bother trying to make God happy? Why would we bother trying to bring pleasure to God? Why would we bother with whether or not he's glorified? Well, this all comes down to where you stand in relationship with that God. If you don't know him, if you haven't stepped into the, the blessing of eternal life that he offers us, this seems very weird. It actually probably seems opposite. Well, no, that's dumb. If I'm going to do all this work, I should get something out of it. The fact of the matter is, God has given us everything. He has given us access to joy and hope and peace and mercy and grace beyond anything that we could imagine. 
He loves us so deeply, so fully. He has given all joy to us. And we can look at that and say, oh, well, good, I deserved it, right? Or I can recognize the incredible grace that it is, the amazing grace that it is and say, I want you to be pleased. I want you to take pleasure. I want you to have glory because you're amazing. We do it for other loved ones, right? When, when you, well, hopefully this is how you do it. If you have someone you love in your life and their birthday comes around, what do you do? You give them something. Now, do you give them something so that you get something in return? No. no. <laughs> Shall saying yes, okay. Like I said, if you're healthy, no. Um, but when we, honestly, when we give someone a gift, we're not going, I sure hope I get something out of this. We go, that person's important. I want them to be pleased. They value, they, or they have value to me. They matter to me. I want to bless them, so I do this thing. That is what building the house is supposed to be. The work we're called to do, yes, it is so that God gets the glory, but in that, I step into his presence and I enjoy the relationship with him. And the work of manifesting his presence is about blessing those he loves. Remember, the, in the New Testament, Jesus teaches us that the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the second is like it, or parallel to it, love others as yourself. If that's the case, if doing it the Jesus way, if manifesting his presence in my life and in the world around me means loving God and loving others, if we're all doing that, who gets loved? Everyone. So even though I am pouring out, I'm getting poured back into. This is not a, well, you're being called to whip and flog yourself and walk through, through life chanting some terrible uh, Gregorian chant and looking down at the ground and always being sad. That's not what you're called to. You're called to great joy but it is about others. We have to stop making it about me. You see, a Jesus-following life requires working hard and not making excuses. That's what they have been doing. They've been saying, oh, but the work is hard. It's not time yet. He was saying, no, do the work. Go up to the hills. Build the house. Put the effort in. Don't make excuses anymore. But we're good at making excuses, right? I, I think at the core of it, all of us have a little bit of a lazy bone to us. Where at any given point, you know what, if I can just sit here and not do that, that's what I'm going to do. Now, we're all driven in different ways, but it's easy to make excuses when things get hard. What we're being called to is to see God for who he is and go, I need to respond in a way that shows the world what I can see. If we keep reading into uh, verse 9, and I know, I want to say, I know I'm moving fast, but this first week is very informational. We'll, we'll slow down for the next couple of weeks. But verse 9, you looked for much, God is saying to the people, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away, talking about their harvests. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, why are things not working out for you? And you know, even as a church, where we're pushing into revitalization, where we're saying, God, you have a history for us. Four decades plus that you have used this church in, in many different ways. We want to take that from where it is and, and expand it into the effort of community and beyond. Where, God, we, we've seen that there's been a falling off in some ways. Why has, it, why has this happened? Why has there not been the harvest that we want? Well, why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house, God is saying my presence being manifested, lies in ruins while each of you busies himself with his own house. I think that's one of the things we have to wrestle with as a church family. Have we been too busy busying ourselves with our house, meaning with getting things my way, doing it the way I want? Or are we concerned with building God's house? Are we concerned with those people who don't know Jesus getting to know Jesus, those people who are far from Jesus drawing closer to Jesus, those people who may hate the idea of Jesus being introduced to the idea that Jesus is truly loving and for them. Have we been, have we been concerned with saying, my life needs to reflect to the world around me a Jesus that loves? Or have we been concerned with getting things my way? I think on an individual level, on a church level, we need to wrestle with those things. Because God is saying the reason there is not plenty 
is because there's a lack of alignment with manifesting my presence, actually living a Jesus-centered life. That's why we say that's so important. That's our purpose. We exist to help people live Jesus-centered lives. Jesus at the center of it all. The manifesting of God's presence in our personal lives and our corporate lives. That's what we're being called to. So if we're struggling to get there, if we're struggling to see the, the harvest come in, we have to step back and question, am I doing that? Are we doing that? Because a Jesus-following life means that we prioritize his kingdom over our own. And I'll tell you, that's hard. It's much easier to worry about what I want because I want it, right? It's much easier for you to go, well, I, I want it this way. I like it this way. I want these things to happen, so that's what's going to happen. And it's not wrong to like things. And you, you, you don't want to get to the point where something you like must be in conflict with what God is asking. I'm not saying that. Please don't go there. We tend to be people of extremes, and we'll kind of lean into that. But a Jesus-following life says, I care more about Jesus' kingdom because I know the good of who Jesus is. I know what it means if he's king of my life, if he's king of our lives, here's all the wonderful, beautiful things that will happen. That matters more. I see Jesus for the beautiful Savior he is. And I value that over the things in my life that conflict with it. That's the rub, where what I want conflicts with his kingdom. And that's where we have to prioritize it. And it's a, it's a, a thing of growth. I don't care if you are somebody who's uh, been following Jesus for 30 minutes or someone who's been following Jesus for 30 years. You're still not all the way there. You can't be. You're going to constantly work on it. There's going to be times where you mess up. And we don't want to go, oh, that's okay, it doesn't matter. But the fact is Jesus' is love, Jesus' is forgiveness, Jesus' is grace, Jesus' is mercy covers all of it. And we just keep following and pushing into that arc of getting closer and closer to Jesus, of prioritizing his kingdom over our own on a more regular basis. Verse 10, therefore the heavens above you have withheld the dew. Here's the, the, the problem. Because you have not been prioritizing building the house and manifesting the presence, the, you have, he's, the heavens have withheld the dew. The earth has withheld its produce. I have called, look at this, God is saying, I'm involved in the process. I'm trying to get your attention for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain and the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast, on all their labors. God is saying things aren't working out and it's not just a coincidence. It's easy to brush things off as coincidence, but I want to tell you what God is telling us is that a Jesus following life acknowledges he will work to get our attention. If something just seems to be falling apart, ask the question, Lord, are you trying to tell me something? I'm not saying that every bad thing that happens is God zipping and flinging pebbles at you. Not what we're saying. What, he, what we are saying is God will do things to get your attention. We need to be honest and open enough to say, God, are you trying to get my attention? Well, then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, they did something. It says, they obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. So when these people heard these words to them, these words that we have been resonating and working with that are a little pointy for us, right? These are not those super happy, cuddly. The God is saying, you know what? You're, you're not doing it my way. I'm trying to get your attention. But when the people, it says, they obeyed the voice of the Lord, they feared him. Not that cowering, you know, like we just went past Halloween and all this, the scary stuff, right? That's not the fear we're talking about. We're talking about amazing, reverent awe of a God that is beyond the imagination, uh, beyond powerful uh, of anything we could imagine. That is the fear we're looking at. When that happened, look here, it says, then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, and that's the same word, messenger, that we talked about in our Unseen series when we talked about angels. It's the same thing. The spokesperson, the one who was taking God's will to the people, spoke to the people with the Lord's message, I am with you. What's the result of obeying God, of doing it the Jesus way, of reverencing God in his glory and his majesty? 
It is enjoying the presence of God. The very thing we're supposed to manifest, we get to rest in, we get to enjoy. And that is the truth. A Jesus following life obeys Jesus and it enjoys the joy of his presence. It is the motivator towards it as much as it is the product of it. The more we manifest his presence, the more we enjoy his presence. The more we enjoy his presence, the more we manifest it. We have, that has to be what we're about, living that Jesus-centered life. Well, in just the last couple of verses, we're wrapping up here. I know it's been an information dump, but let's just get through this. Verse 14, and the Lord stirred up the spirit. He wouldn't let them just sit in it. It wasn't just this, huh, yeah, that's good. I think we should do that. It stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. Why am I highlighting that? Because look what comes next. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, at that time. Who did the work? Who did the work? Who's they? Catch this. I think one of the things that we, it's easy for us to default in because we tend to be very consumeristic in, in our culture is that sounds like great work for the pastor to do. I think that would be great. God, you know, the pastor should manifest the spirit of God in his life. Yes, that's great. Okay, well, well, well m- maybe Bud and Harold too. I mean, they're, they're elders at the church. Yeah, they can do it. They're, they're the leaders, right? They can do it. It's easy to think that it's others' jobs, those who are more upfront, those who are more visible, those who have been doing it longer. But it says, all the remnant. So everyone who came out of captivity, who had been sent back to Jerusalem, all of them, they came and worked on the house of the Lord. They began the work of helping God uh, be shown to the nations, of his presence being manifested in that temple, because a Jesus following life affirms God's direction and actually moves in it. So often we tend to default. We tend to default to say, yes, I agree. That's a good idea. Yes, uh, that, that's, that's fine to do, or that's good to do, or we should do that. Yes. And not actually make any movement towards it. What we see in Haggai here is that the people had made excuses and were worrying about themselves above and beyond what God was calling them to. And then there's the temptation of even seeing it. You know, like, I don't know if you've been like me and you've been to different places. I've been a, a follower of Jesus now since I've been about almost 19. So I've got a, a few decades in here. And I've been places, been like, oh, I went there and I was just really convicted by, insert thing I felt convicted by. I felt impacted. Oh, yes, this is something. But do you know the ratio of things convicted by to obedience in my life? Well, in a you know, perfect Jesus world, they're the same. If I was convicted by it, I'd do something about it. But unfortunately, the convicted by and the do by is very different. And what I found is that's the case for, for a lot of us. What I'm calling you to do is to open your hearts up that God may be asking you to reevaluate your priorities. The things that you have been about recently over the years, maybe even your whole life. Because if our priorities don't line up with his, we are doing it the wrong way. And like God said, (laughs) I called these things into your life, these difficulties to get your attention. In just a moment, we're going to sing a final song. But before we do that, I'm going to invite you to pray with me. Father, we do thank you that you pursue us. We thank you that in in the midst of the, the hubbub and the busyness of our world and all the things that we can be about, good things even, that we thank you that you call to us, that you do try to get our attention. Because it's easy for us to have our eyes drift and our hearts to wander. God, help us to see you for the glorious, beautiful, majestic God you are, and may we pursue you with everything that we have. Thank you, Jesus, for the sacrifice that you made, that you would call us to be part of your family, that you would make the way possible. May you, great God in heaven, receive all the glory and all the praise. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. 
Amen.